I saw in the photo you had like a, a writer. So you could write credit cards, yeah? Yep. You lost millions of dollars by reporting this and you went to jail for, was it nine months? Eight months and a fraction. Yeah, probably close to nine months. Everyone should be like thanking you, but that's not what happened, is that right? The fact that I did what I considered it was the right thing to do, for me was more than enough. I learned nothing about security except how to hack the system from the university. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's important that we raise the profile that hacking isn't a crime. <laughs> Everyone, it's David Bumble back with a very special guest from South America. Alberto, welcome. Hello, how are you, David? Very good. How are you? Welcome. I'm doing great. Thank you. So you're based in Uruguay and you, if I understand correctly, were the first hacker to be imprisoned in Uruguay for so-called crimes. Yeah, that's right. That's correct. I was the one. So let's go back. I heard on an interview that you started hacking when you were very young. Is that right? That's right. And actually, I will try to do it. Do you see up there? Yep. It's a Sinclair Spectrum Plus, 48 kilobytes of RAM. And it has a device that was connected to the external adapter. And with a button, you produce an interruption on the processor. It creates an int and basically processes the CPU. And you could see all the contents of the memory uh, in assembler. And I started learning assembler uh, playing with that. Sorry, so how old learned, how old were you when you did this? Yeah, I was twelve year old. Twelve year old, and you were doing assembly then. Wow, that's right. Yeah, I learned, for example, things as easy as okay, you can load the registry with the command LD, the name of the register A, for example, comma and a number. So if a game has six lives, I could try to find LD A comma six. Okay, whenever I found something like that, I modified the six and I put 10 instead of the six. <laughs> While other children of my age were playing soccer in the street, I was basically hacking computer games. For me, the most amazing part was that when I first found uh, this kind of thing that I could do, I submitted them to a, a Spanish magazine that was called Micromania that was covering uh, video games in that time. That magazine was published in, in Spain then was sent to Argentina and then came to Uruguay. And we're talking about 35 years ago, after the, the magazine was published, I had to wait about a year, a year and a half to have that publication here in Uruguay. And one day, my mother went and buy the, a copy of the magazine. And when I opened it, I saw my name in the magazine, so showing that I, my submission, it was like, wow, I can't believe it. I mean... They published this in this magazine. It was for a child, like, I don't know, it's better than getting Santa Claus gift in Christmas. <laughs> I mean, it was amazing. That was basically my beginning in, in this hacking world. Yeah, and after that, well, many things happened in my life. I have a degree on computer sciences. I'm a computer engineer. Uh, I have to tell you, university, I learned nothing about security except how to hack the system from the university. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I started university in 1994. And in those years, security was not at all considered as part of the career in any part. The closest thing to that was systems auditory. That was the, in the last year of the career, you learned about audit systems. So... Then my first job was uh, as a computer forensics examiner for uh, a criminal case in Uruguay regarding child pornography. And well, it was in 2004. Then I had to learn myself a lot of things regarding forensics. I mean, it was something that I took really seriously because the result of what you do will affect the life of a person. So you have to be competent in what you do, you have to do a responsible work, you have to know what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, it's not something that you can say, okay, I will just do it. No, you have to do it seriously. I keep working on that until one point that all the cases were related to child pornography. And at one point I say, okay, no, I cannot keep doing this. This is not healthy for me. It was too much. I mean, the material you have to go through, you will imagine, you, you hear child pornography, and maybe you, you think of certain things, but what I saw in my case was really something that I didn't ever expect to see. So I, I decided to quit that 
but the knowledge regarding computer forensics, uh, I kept. I don't know if this was, if I read this correctly, on the side, you were also like discovering problems. So like in 2016, you discovered a security problem in, in the stock, stock exchange. Is that right? Uh, in, in, that was in Asuncion, Paraguay, in Uruguay. It was the stock exchange of Asuncion, Paraguay. Yeah. I couldn't contact the people from the stock exchange in Asuncion. So I just contact the third of my country. So I said, okay, they have this problem. If you can contact them, here you have. It's not my problem. I just want to let you know that this is going on. And the people from the third, you know, they are all connected uh, between each other, exchanging information. So I thought, okay, for them, it won't be complicated to, to contact the people that are in charge of uh, the, the stock exchange of Asuncion. And yeah, in a matter of a few days, the problem was solved. You've done this multiple times. And one, the one that we're going to focus on is on, in 2014, you found an issue with a medical provider. But uh, what you were doing is finding problems and then reporting it to the CERT of Uruguay. Is that right? Yeah, mostly to the CERT. Yeah, most of the time it was to the CERT. In some cases, the findings were not uh, important or were just probably minor things. I eventually might have contact directly the people in charge of the systems, but mostly I, this, I for me it was the best to report directly to the CERT. There's no bug bounty in Uruguay, or there wasn't at that time, is that right? No, unfortunately there was not. Not only a bug bounty program uh, is needed here, but also have uh, legal warranties that if you are doing things that are just for research, that you are not trying to cause any harm or damage. If you just enter into a system and you can smell that something is bad and you shouldn't have be afraid of any consequences for reporting that or doing that. And those warranties don't exist in my country. So many people, after they, they realize what happened to me, they stop reporting things to the south of my country because they were afraid. It was a lose-lose situation. Nobody was winning for any kind of uh, information security administration system, the most probably uh, useful input is the report of incidents. That's how they know they can measure how the security is in the system, what are the problems that are happening, what are the issues that are going on. So uh, if you don't get those reports, you are basically having even a lot of advantage to, to, to the bad guys to to do the things that they're doing. Let's talk about what exactly happened in 2014. If I understand correctly, your girlfriend of the time was um, trying to access some medical records. Is that right? Could you just explain like what happened in 2014 and then happened in 2015, just to give like background for people who don't know your story? In 2014, in October of that year, I was in the apartment of my ex-girlfriend and I was in bed with her notebook and she told me, that she had to access to the medical provider to check some information. Uh, I don't remember if she wanted to schedule an appointment with a doctor or what. So she told me, can you access? Yes. She gave me the address to, to go. And then she asked me, okay, do you want the password? And then after a few seconds of silence, she said, no, I'm already in. What? Yeah, I'm already in, but not only that. I mean, but with the privilege of administrator. What, what did you do? Nothing, I just put admin in the username and admin in the password. And I mean, as administrator, <laughs> that's it. And I was like, is this real? No, I mean, this is a medical provider's uh, system. This cannot be happening. Then I look at it, okay, what's going on? This is not correct. I took a look at some things. Okay, yes, I am as administrator logged in the system. This is something that must be solved immediately. What I did, okay, cert at cert.ui from Alberto Hill. I described the problem in a paragraph. I said, okay, the IP from where I connected is this. After an hour, I got an email from Santiago Paz, who was the director of the cert, saying that he confirmed that what I said was correct. That for me was, wow. This is interesting. I mean, it's a Saturday. The director of the search is answering directly to me. Well, I'm happy. That's great. That's it. Because when you report an incident, then once you transfer that to, to the search or to whoever is in charge of that, 
the what they do after that is not of your business. I mean, that's it. It's not your problem anymore. I said, well, I can sleep without any problem tonight because I did what I had to do. It was a responsible report, wasn't it? I mean, you responsibly reported it. I think you said it was like only a few minutes later after you discovered that, that you reported it. I think it was within uh, 15 minutes after finding that, that, I, okay, I mean, for me, it was clear what I had to do. Yeah. What I did was to protect others uh, my, I was not part of that medical provider, so my information was not involved there, was not in danger. But the information of more than 200,000 people, the medical records of more than 200 people was involved. We're talking about a lot of people. Uruguay has 3 million people. Uh, so we're talking about 9% of, of the population of Uruguay included there. That's a lot of people, uh, medical records. But anyway, it doesn't matter whether it was 9%, 10%, or 1%, or two medical records. It was just wrong. That information should be protected. Let me see if I summarize this right. You're on the internet. You go to the medical provider's website. You can log in as admin, admin. You have full access to everything. You realize there's a major problem here because anyone could do that. Then you, rather than hacking their website and taking their data, you reported this to CERT within 15 minutes. They replied back saying that they've got that. They gave you a reference number. So you weren't a black hat hacker, if you like. You were being a responsible white hat hacker. I mean, you discovered a security flaw and you reported it. Everyone should be like thanking you, but that's not what happened. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, sometimes I realized I was so naive. When you do what you consider is the right thing to do, the outcome it's not what you expect, yeah. and that's sad. But yeah, in my case, nobody told me, thank you, about The fact that I did what I considered it was the right thing to do, for me, was more than enough. I mean, I, I wasn't expecting, not even a thank you. I mean, just I was expecting them to solve the problem, to help those 200,000 people that were uh, potentially affected with that. But nothing happened because you accessed it again in 2017, is that right? And it still had problems, is that right? Well, it was 2015. In 2015, again, my girlfriend told me, Alberto, uh, can you access to the website of my medical provider because I want to? Okay, I never learned. I entered into the medical provider system, sir, uh, website. 15 years of being in the security field and you are in front of a system. You can smell when something doesn't look good and you can see that somehow there is a way of doing something that can result that are not supposed to be provided by the system. So it took me like 10 minutes and in 10 minutes I could again access to all the medical records of all the people of the medical provider. But this time, hold on, this time it was not admin admin. I didn't need any password. I didn't even need any username. I didn't need to be authenticated. All I had to do was modify a parameter in a URL instead of a one, put in a two, and I would jump in from record one to record two. Imagine creating a text file with all those URLs and having Google indexing that. In a couple of days, you can search the name of anybody and you can see his medical record because it would be indexed by Google. <laughs> as easy as that, no username, no password. I said, oh my God, these guys never learn. I was taking for granted that they would not only solve the admin admin problem that was nothing but hardening, but they would also say, okay, we had this problem. So basically we had no idea about security. There might be some other big issues to consider. And I was thinking that, okay, they probably did uh, any kind of uh, security reviews and testing. What I found tells me that mm, they didn't. And okay, 15 minutes after that, mail to the CERT saying, okay, I put the URL, the parameters, send to CERT, and then an, an email from somebody from the CERT that was not, in this case, Santiago Paz, the director, but another person saying, thank you, Alberto. Uh, thank you very much for your report. Uh, and that was it. So I thought to myself, Alberto, stop entering to this uh, site because every time you enter, you, you have... <laughs> 
I mean, if I was paid for this, I would probably be getting a lot of money, but it was not about money. It was about, I don't want to see these things. I mean, I want to see the system are strong, protected. These people really need to be aware of security and the basic things in order to protect this kind of system. For me, it was like insulting to, to see those things. It's mad in today's world with uh, bug bounty programs. Companies are paying lots of money for people to do what you did. I've got to ask the question. People will say, but it wasn't ethical that you tested their systems. Is your response, you saw a problem and you reported it ethically. You went, you emailed it to search. You didn't try and hack the system. You found a problem and you reported it. And I think it's important that we raise the profile that hacking isn't a crime. And I know that's something that you were really a big um, you know, advocate of. Hacking is not a crime. I mean, the, the, the guy who, who found the organization Hacking is Not a Crime once messaged me in LinkedIn and he told me, Alberto, it would be an honor if you could join uh, our organization. Wow. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, uh, so those kind of things of recognition, priceless. Uh, just to tell you the fact that n nobody of the people who know me ever, ever asked me, Alberto, did you do that thing? No, nobody ever asked me because they knew me and they already knew the answers. Curiosity is something that all of us, yeah. I mean, we surely do not lack of curiosity. Curiosity is something that we have in excess, all of the people in cybersecurity, creativity, using things like admin, admin to try to, when you're in front of a username and password is something that you don't, you do it naturally. I mean, you enter into a system and you just type admin, admin, just, just, it's like a game, it's like, you have incorporated with that when you see a URL with the parameters that are not in code or the parameters are in plain text and you see patterns and all that, okay, you cannot help but modifying a number and see how the system reacts. I mean, and that is not a crime, that is not illegal. You're not altering anything in the system in a way that, okay, I gain access because I modify this file and I execute this exploit. So on the server side, this was executed, so I got, I got access to this. No, I mean, uh, the system was designed like that, and I just had to uh, do certain things that were not, for me, it was not hacking. For me, it was like something very silly and stupid that unfortunately worked. Uh, it was not like using MetaXploit and sending a, a payload to to be in a mail email to somebody in the medical institution and waiting for the person to click and creating a reverse shell to your computer. I mean, people are paid to do this these days. I mean, that's what the whole bug bounty thing is. And the thing is that after being released from prison, I won't deny it. I mean, I kept doing it and I kept finding problems in system. After being released in two months, I found two very important security issues in two systems of the government. Unfortunately, uh, I, what did I do? Okay, I won't deny it. Took a snapshot for my ego. I mean, okay, I was there, been there. I was in, okay, uh, encrypted, PCP, uh, save it, close the notebook, and go to bed. That's sad. We need to tell the story because, I mean, you reported it. And actually, the reporting is what the government used to, to lock you away, if I understand correctly. So... Let, talk us through it, and then I want to come back to that because now you, you, you're nervous about reporting, and it, and it's, and I think it's a concern for a lot of people who discover vulnerabilities or discover issues. Do they actually report it? Um, so what happened in 2017? The Interpol came to my apartment. They came with a search warrant. They arrest me. They say said all the things that I had. They didn't tell me anything. They took me to our premises. They interrogated me. I was two days in Interpol. In, in, a, in a cell, and on September 11, it was a Monday, the judge sentenced that I should go to prison as a preventive measure for a computer-related crime. And apparently, I say apparently because I have my doubts, the medical provider was hacked uh, on February of, of that year, 2017. I was accused of that. Even if I'm guilty, prison time is not the way you pay for, for that. But in my case, the judge, she considered that it was pretty likely that I would want to escape from my country and that my knowledge related to computer security was so high that I could alter the rest of the process. 
In other words, she thought that with my mind, I could alter evidence, equipment, uh, material that was stored on an Interpol facility. <laughs> no, uh, I can tell the judge that uh, I cannot do those kind of things with my mind. I cannot alter any kind of things uh, remotely, not yet. Uh, maybe with the metaverse, but right now I cannot do it. Uh, he couldn't. She couldn't understand a person she a, a profile she never had to face. She never faced before, and that uh, fear of the unknown. Okay, what do we do with this person that we have no idea what he can do? We just send him to prison and we lock him there, and that's it. That's the easy way to handle uh, something that is unknown and fear like me. My mother offered two houses, money and a lot of assets as warranty to, for my bail. Imagine two, two properties as a warranty uh, for, for, for my bail, and it was denied. When I was reading some of the stuff, they, they found a bunch of like Hack 5 stuff in your apartment. They found a bunch of hacking stuff. So obviously, they were they, from what you've told like Jack on uh, Darknet Diaries and what I've read elsewhere, they didn't quite understand what that was all about. So she was scared that you could magically, like you said, do something to affect the case, so it was better to put you in jail. Is that is that correct? That's that's exactly what happened. Exactly, yeah. So were you actually jailed for hacking the medical provider? Because that's what they accused you of initially. They said someone wanted bitcoins. I think it was 50 bitcoins, is that right? Something like that. After being released from prison, I got access to the file of my case. And when I went to the page where that supposed uh, email with that requirement of bitcoins was made, and I read it, it says, send 15 bitcoins to the following address and then the address was blank wow. there was no address i mean <laughs> even if they wanted to pay for the ransom there was no way they could do it because there was no address to send the bitcoin so that was the most pathetic ransomware attack i ever saw i mean they were asking for bitcoins and they were not giving an address to to make the the the, the, the transfer were any records stolen, to your knowledge, or were any records encrypted or leaked? As far as I know, nothing was ever uh, released or leaked. Uh, I could saw parts of the logs uh, of the medical provider of the Fortinet firewall, and I can tell you, the days of the supposed attack, the outcoming traffic of the server, 200 megabytes. It's like... Nothing. I mean, it's like not even a, a movie in MP4 format. A database with 200,000 medical records, probably we're talking about, I have no idea, but maybe we're talking about a terabyte. I don't know. Ten ter I have no idea, really. But it's surely not 200 megabytes. How did they tie it to you? Did they say that your IP address accessed the firewall and uh, pulled data out, or was it, did they just blame it on the fact that you reported it to CERT? Uh, on the media and in the interrogation, they said that they could trace the IP address of that email to my house. That is false. Uh, they didn't trace any uh, the, that email to any IP address. That is not part of the investigation. They never did that. There was a connection from an IP that belonged to me on a certain date of January of that year. Whenever I connect to a site, I don't know, at that moment, I had many clients for the browser and you know, I go to my bank and okay, when I'm in the login page, I have my Shodan plugin. I'm curious and I try to see, okay, what other ports are open? I probably expect only the, the port 80 and 443. Uh, if I see something more, I'm curious to try to find out. Yeah, uh, there are plugins that probably send some kind of packet to, to the server to try to test certain port. So there was just one connection from that IP that uh, was dropped by the firewall. So basically, nothing. I mean, it was just a connection that the firewall detected and dropped. So I was actually no connection directly with the server. I, yeah, there was an IP that was apparently mine there, but I don't exactly remember what it was the, the request, but uh, it was something completely not harmful. Uh, but it was not associated to me. It was associated to another, uh, to the IP of another person. So the day of my arrest and the search warrant uh, that they executed in my house, they also arrested and they did the same with another person in Uruguay. So we were two people arrested for this case. So the fact that 
they trace an, I, an IP in an email to me or to a house is completely stupid. I mean, uh, if they arrest two people, it's not because an IP was traced to the house of somebody. I mean, there's no email that has two IP addresses of two different people uh, in different locations. That's impossible. So what they mentioned about the email and tracing that to the criminal is completely false. It's just based on some logs that are not complete. And so far, my conclusion is that no, nothing was stolen from there. There was no evidence. Did they ever prosecute the other person? He was sent to to CART, uh, but he was released shortly after. I mean, he spent a night in prison, I think. Uh, all his equipment remained uh, in with the Interpol as mine, uh, but that's it. He was released very quickly. They, they just realized that that person absolutely had no, no kind of knowledge about, uh, well, I mean, Okay, let's be honest. The way I access to the systems in both cases that are reported, I think that a kid can do. I mean, anybody can go and put admin admin. Yeah. You don't have yeah. to be a genius. You don't have to be an ethical hacker certified. No, something that you anybody can do. The other thing uh, of accessing the URL and modifying it, anybody can do that. It doesn't require you to be a master or uh, the, the best hacker in the world to do that. No. It's something that is very easy. And if I did it, I don't know, was I the first, was me the first person who did that in a time frame of four years, three years, maybe some other people access to the system in that time frame. And I, we don't know, uh, but maybe those people did what I did and they could access to the system and they just didn't report it. That's something that I don't know, but it's something that might have happened. It's three years, so it's a long time. So they confiscated a lot of your equipment. And um, I suppose if you don't understand this stuff, it looked like you were up to no good because what did they find? They found a lot of money. So could you just tell us like what kind of money did they find? What kind of equipment did they find? I think it's nice for people who are in this space to see the kind of equipment that you had. I mean, I was looking at that and I showed my wife the photo and she is like, David, do you have any of that equipment? And it's like, yes, I do. For example, this is on the floor right now here. Why do a person have all this ledger wallet without opening in his house? This is not normal. Yeah. Well, I was basically represented ledger in Uruguay and Paraguay uh, the time I was arrested. From France, they sent me a box full of ledger wallets of all kinds of models. Yeah, I had plenty of ledger wallets because I was reselling the, the wallets in Uruguay and Paraguay. If you went to the website of Leisure, you could see my contact information there in the sellers of the world. They never asked me. They didn't know what this was. When they came here, they asked me, what's this? They thought they were pen drive. They have no clue. You had a lot of credit cards, didn't you? I saw on the photo, you had like a, a writer. So you could write credit cards, yeah? Yep. This is, for example. I've got one of those, yeah. Yep. Uh, oh, 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 come on. You're a creep. Oh, get away from me. Oh, my God. I'm talking. Oh, no. I've, oh, I've, my I've, God. Got, I've got a YouTube video, which I'll put below, where I show people how to use that. I mean, oh, the problem my God. With it. I would send that to the south of my country. No, please they don't. Would go after please you. don't. They would go after you. <laughs> please don't. <laughs> no. Okay. You, you understand. I mean, you're a security professional. The tools, the knowledge, the skills that we have, the endless curiosity between those who are ethical hackers and those who are criminals are the same. We all use the same tools. We all have the same skills. We all have the same knowledge. We all have the same curiosity. We all are human beings. The difference is on the ethics. On, okay, in my case, I would never use any kind of knowledge, tools, skills to commit any kind of crime, that's not me. Uh, I would never do that. Uh, that's the difference. Why did I have so many credit cards? Why did I have those writers and readers of magnetic cards? Okay, I have an explanation from that. That year, I was a reseller from a UK company that was called Euquid, that was issuing uh, debit cards visa uh, that were charged with like 200 different cryptocurrencies. And uh, okay, I could charge them, for example, with a thousand dollars in bitcoins, and then I could uh, go with that card to an ATM in Montevideo, and I could get from the ATM nine hundred ninety-eight dollars for each thousand uh, dollars that I deposit. So there was only a two dollars commission for getting a thousand dollars in bitcoins uh, with that ATM card. It was like the commission was nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean. 
Uh, so I was just testing those credit cards, testing the security and chips. I was very, I was very curious, uh, and those kind of things for me are fascinating. Okay, if I was going to work with that, I needed to understand all the things behind magnetic card, credit cards. Uh, that's me. Uh, I wanted to know. I wanted to learn. You could have taken that medical provider and um, asked them for Bitcoin, which supposedly that's what the hacker did. But you actually lost Bitcoins in this whole, um, or cryptocurrency in this whole affair. Is that right? That's correct, yeah. Do you mind sharing how much you lost? We're talking about 26 Bitcoins, 1,000 Ethereum, 10,000 Litcoins. We're talking about something that at that moment was important. Right now, we're talking about millions of dollars. Probably. When you're doing something that you consider it the right thing to do. It's not always what you expect. It's not always a thank you. It's not always a reward. I can live with the damages that this caused to me, but it's hard for me to live with the consequences that all the situation caused to other people, other people I love, other people I care. But I mean, it, it was um, a huge toll on you because you lost millions of dollars by reporting this and you went to jail for, was it nine months? Eight, eight months and a fraction, yeah, probably close to nine months. They didn't charge you for a specific crime, if I understand it right. You were locked up for eight months. Why did they release you? Uh, my lawyer uh, asked for freedom uh, in three three times after my arrest. Uh, the prosecutor and the judge denied that. He appealed that decision of sending me to prison for as a preventing uh, measure. And the appeal failed in my favor. And they say, okay, this person uh, shouldn't be in prison. Uh, he should be released. But first, he has to pay a $10,000 bail. Wow. I was in a prison where I think nobody there, if they were granted a bail uh, to get released of, with that amount of money, would actually have access to that money to uh, get the freedom. So imagine, okay, my mother, fortunately, she could get the funds immediately and deposit them. So in a matter of hours, uh, I was released. But imagine the frustration of those people that actually eventually could have been granted that possibility. And just because they didn't have the money, don't have the money, just because they are pure, just because of that, they cannot get out. They have to stay because of lacking of that money. And then for me, that point was like, okay, this thing that I believe in, justice, is something is very wrong here. Justice is a beautiful word. If you look it up in the dictionary, it's a concept that is beautiful. This is not justice. It's justice that if you have money, you can get out of prison. But if you are pure, you cannot get out of prison. It shouldn't justice be the same for everybody, no matter whether you're rich, pure. This is completely unfair. And for me, it was like, Okay, all the things I thought that I believe were working, all the things I really trust in the system were like falling like a domino effect. I realized that everything was full of problems, uh, full of flaws. And for me, it was like, okay, I thought I had a lot of experience in the world, a lot of knowledge, but I realized in my prison time that I was really naive. I was really silly, and that experience really made me open my eyes and say, okay, Alberto, wake up. You know nothing. You're stupid. This is the real world. This is where you will learn what the, the world is about. The, it's cruel, but this is where you will actually learn what the world is about. It's not that you have been able to travel. Fortunately, you had the luck to travel to a lot of places in the planet, to live in different places. That is not something that may, made you a better person. This will make you see the world from a different perspective. And after this, uh, you will change the way you get the information, you process the information and you see the world and you perceive that the reality won't be the same after this experience. And it was not after leaving prison for me, after reading my file, after uh, processing all the things that I live. Okay, the system really is something that is completely bad, must change. All these things are completely unfair. So something must be done. This is, this is not what I thought it was justice because I thought everything was working in a proper way, but no, 
nothing was working in a proper way. One question I've got is still thinking about is, are those charges still ongoing? So is there the possibility that they come back and put, and like charge you and try and put you in jail again? I never told this to anybody, uh, uh, not even on social media or in any interview. But right now, uh, the case is closed. I have no right. criminal record. Um, I have no I have no restrictions. I'm a person that is completely free to live a life. Case closed. That's fantastic news. I mean, it's, I know it's been really tough. So I'm really glad that you that that's that's finally come to a close. Well, there are things that will never get repair of the damage. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about other things that you cannot solve with money because during all this process, I lost many things. Yeah. And I think all I have left is my mother. And then everything else is gone. Some people that I really love pass away while I was in prison. I wasn't able to be with them when they need me. And those things will forever. Uh, I mean, I will have a scars forever with me. Okay, I have no no criminal records, but is this uh, end? Is this justice? I don't think so. I don't think they will ever be justice, no matter what happened after this. What they did is something that is unforgettable, unforgivable, and I don't see a way of repairing that. What they did to a person is something that cannot be uh, ever repaired in any way. I mean, no money in the world. Nothing can give me back things that I lost in the, this time. And again, just for trying to do the right thing, it's hard to process and, and to, to believe that happened. But yeah, it happened. I'm glad that you're sharing this with all of us. It's a cautionary tale. I can't speak in the situation that you're, you've been through, but it's a warning for all of us that you know doing the right thing isn't always going to give you the result that you think it's going to give you. When people approach me asking me for advice on how to begin into cybersecurity, okay. Uh, guys in college, uh, in any course that you might take, they don't teach you certain things that are going to happen in your life. You are going to be in a field where you will be under a lot of pressure, where you will see things that you weren't ever told that you were going to see, and you won't know how to handle those things. When I was working for my, when I started actually, um, in the government working as an infosec uh, professional, okay, uh, I, one, it was more than probably 12 years ago, I detected certain um, unusual activity in the logs of a system. And okay, at one point after reviewing and reviewing those logs, I came to the conclusion that the only thing that could explain that, that was that somebody was accessing and altering the information of the system uh, from inside. And okay, what do I do? Okay, I have to report that. Yeah. I mean, uh, in that position, it's not only ethical, it is a crime if you uh, are aware of a criminal uh, activity. In if, if you work for the government, you are witness of that and you don't report that, you are part of the, of the crime. So, okay, you have to go to upper management, to the director of the organization and tell him, okay, uh, somebody is committing a fraud here, is modifying information in a critical system for the country. Okay, but the person probably doesn't want that to be known because he doesn't want to be on the front page of the newspaper saying that the organization of the government that he's the director of is uh, that is happening. So, okay, what do you do? I mean, a lot of pressure, a lot of decisions, a lot of things that. Uh, I mean, are complicated to deal with, and in university they don't tell you, and that things you it, don't go and try to become a hacker because it's cool. Do it because you really feel the passion for it, and you are willing to go anywhere with that because it's going to be a journey that is going to be beautiful. But the whole truth is not. It's going to be a rose garden every time. There will be storms a lot of times and for those storms they never told you to, to bring an umbrella you just have to learn on the run okay uh, I found this what do I do now uh, I don't know I, and you feel a lot of pressure a lot of uh, different things and you don't know how to act but you should be prepared for that I mean universities courses should tell you the bad part of this and how to handle those situations 
dealing with people that are committing crimes next to you, working next to you, it's not easy. You have to keep working next to those people uh, when you know what they're doing. Uh, that's not easy. Uh, and nobody tells you that. They just tell you, okay, these are, I don't know, uh, the processes of a pen testing, blah, blah, blah. This is uh, what uh, the domains of the ISO Jake 27,000, blah, blah, blah. But nobody tells you, okay, this might happen, will happen, and when this happens, okay, you should handle this in this way. I always say technical stuff is so easy compared to, you know, ethical stuff or real life stuff. It's much easier to work with machines than with people, um, I find. What is your advice then? My advice is, okay, guys, uh, be aware, this is wonderful. Uh, I want everybody that loves our security to get into the field. Come on, get in. But some things that are not nice are going to happen. Uh, be aware of that. I mean, don't be surprised and say, I can't believe this is happening. No, this will happen. And don't be surprised. Just be prepared. Be prepared because when that happens, uh, you won't have time to think. You will just have to act. It's like the story of, uh, I don't know, of the pilot of an airplane that was about to crash. And in a matter of two seconds, he made a maneuver that saved the aircraft. And when he lands, somebody approaches him and he asks, oh, when did you decide to make that movement that saved the aircraft? And the pilot relaxes him. <laughs> that movement. <laughs> I made that decision 20 years ago when I was learning how to fly, when I was in the flight simulator. I didn't have to make that decision now. I mean, I, we would all have been dead if it was like that. I mean, I just have to do what I learned when I was in the flight simulator, when I was learning to fly. Okay, the same apply here. Uh, just be prepared. And when it happens, just do what uh, you were prepared to do. It's easy, as you said, to work with computers. But we are going to work with human beings. And good luck, human beings. We are very complex. We are very complex here too. What's your motivation to like get more and more people to hear your story? What happened to me is something that I would like to tell everybody because when I went to college, uh, those guys, those people that want to enter into cybersecurity, they should know that, you know, you couldn't imagine how many people contacted me after I became not famous, but notorious because of the experience I had to live. And they approached me and they asked me, uh, Alberto, I uh, saw your story in Dark Diaries, it was inspiring, blah, blah, blah. Can you give me any kind of advice on how to begin a career in cybersecurity? Yeah. My answer is, with a question is, okay, why? Why are you considering that? Okay, the only answer I don't like to hear, I don't want to hear is because of the money. If the, the answer is that, ah, that is not something, the answer that I would like to hear from a person that is approaching me like that. But sometimes that's the answer. I want people like me to feel passion for what they do. The money only, okay, we might have a lot of professionals in the future earning big salaries, but being completely frustrated in life, living miserable lives, doing something that they don't like just because of a good salary. Yeah. Now, that doesn't make any sense. Go, I mean, go and follow your dreams, no matter what your dreams are. Now I, I am into the NFT world, interacting with the artists that are creating so wonderful pieces of art in the NFT communities. is amazing. Those people, uh, I heard so many stories about, okay, nobody ever value what you were doing. The, the, the parents were always saying, oh, son, what you're doing is wasting your time. That thing is completely useless. But despite all that, they kept doing it. Okay, and some of them right now are succeeding. They're selling their pieces of art of, uh, as NFTs. They're making money. They're making a living from that. My respect, you're following your dreams. You're doing what you love and you're making a living for that. But I think everybody should find their passion and make a living from that if you can. Sometimes I know uh, it's something that not, doesn't happen all the time, but that's, I think, is the the way of living a life that makes you feel, okay, I'm doing something that I love. This is not a meaningless life. Uh, and okay, I can make a living from it. For me, cybersecurity is part of me. I cannot imagine my life without this. I am in contact with many people that serve peace on time in the USA for computer-related crimes. For example, one of them was the first 
person who hacked a SCADA system in the USA. He was sent to prison because of that. And they wanted to make an example of him. So uh, his sentence was uh, 10 years, I think. He had to serve two extra years for violating his probation. And that person, after being released, said, Alberto, I don't want to know anything more about computers. I mean, I don't want to touch a computer anymore. And I was thinking, okay, this person who has extremely amazing skills, knowledge, is basically uh, not wanting to keep doing that because, okay, the consequences of 12 years in prison in the USA are not something that is nice. I mean, it's something that is really traumatic uh, to a point nobody can imagine. But then keep talking to them after a while. They say, okay, Alberto, you know, you were right. I will never actually recover my life unless I go back to do what I love, which is hacking, meaning hacking, not as hacking as a crime, but hacking as uh, doing, uh, finding problems in a system, uh, correcting problems. That's part of their life. And it's sad when a person, the system makes a person lose that. It's a lose-lose situation. We're losing a, an excellent potential uh, professional and the society just had to pay for that because uh, prison time, in my case, my, my, the taxpayer had to pay $900 for each month I was in prison. Make the numbers. I was eight months in prison. So that's ridiculous. I mean, yeah. I'm not violent. I, I mean, I would never escape from my country for this or for anything. They didn't bother to make a profile of me. Uh, no, they were just waiting the time where uh, I could have been uh, told, okay, you can do community work. You can teach anything, computer sciences to children, to whatever, as a way of um, an alternative way of uh, that uh, preventive prison measure. There's, there were so many things I could do for society instead of being sent to prison and put in a situation where I was winning nothing, being sent to a place where normally most of the people get out being worse than they were before being there. It's a university of crime. You are surrounded by criminals. Uh, the temptation of becoming a criminal is very high. You have to be very strong to uh, stay away from that and don't be tempted. I have no doubt that many people with my profile that are sent to prison end up, instead of uh, getting released and get, trying to get their life back, no, uh, maybe they didn't commit any crime or maybe they did something minor. Well, uh, after prison, they're not surprising that they're going to be out and be doing much more uh, severe crimes related to hacking, they will be having a lot of contacts in the cyber crime and they will be very, very interested on those skills for making money for themselves. It should be analyzed. The solution of sending a person like me to prison just destroys the person, gives no benefit to the society and potentially can create a much worse and dangerous person than the person supposed, the danger the person supposed to have before going to prison. But I, I really want to thank you for sharing. It's a, I can see it's, it's I, I have no idea what you went through, but I really want to thank you for sharing your story with us and, you know, giving advice to, to the younger generation. Thank you. No, thank you very much, David. And anyone who wants to ask me any question about my case that have listened to my story here or anywhere else, feel free to contact me. I mean, I'm open to talk to anybody. Uh, I love uh, when somebody question certain things about my case. I have just answered for those questions. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can answer those questions without any problem. But yeah, thank you very much. Thanks so much. Tell everyone, and thank you really, uh, David. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here, and I hope you can reach a million uh, subscribers soon. Amazing. Wow, what numbers? I mean, not many people can reach a number, so your success uh, says a lot about you. Um, you. congratulations and you surely deserve the success and this is just the beginning you you will probably at one point say okay i am at nine million subscribers only one million left in 10 million so you will do it man anything you want you can have in life i really appreciate it thank you and you know thank you for sharing your journey with us because um you know youtube numbers are, are, are wonderful and i mean 
it's not the numbers that count, it's the people. So every, I want to thank everyone who's watching, but I also want to thank people like you, you know, thanks so much for sharing your advice and your story with all of us. It's important to know, you know, what happens in the real world and not just in a YouTube video. So thank you for sharing, you know, real world stuff with us. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share this with everybody. So another accomplishment for me, uh, okay, more people knowing my story. We can make a revolution, we can make a change, we can improve things. I'm so sorry. Like probably the third of my country is uh, monitoring. <laughs> shut up, Alberto, shut up. Stop talking about that. Don't keep sharing that, Alberto. We already, <laughs> you already cost us a lot of headaches.